so thank you everyone for um, being part of this virtual roundtable um, titled Scaling for Change, Harnessing the Power of Pakistan's Private Sector after Glasgow. Uh, it's great to have you all here. Uh, we are very excited to have gathered representatives from uh, such diverse and prominent leading organizations uh, across Pakistan, including multilateral agencies, NGOs, and the private sector. My name is Maha Qasim, and uh, I'm Global Science Country Advisor for Pakistan. Earlier, I was providing climate finance advisory services to um, one of Pakistan's uh, leading utility companies and a commercial bank. Uh, I've also been working uh, in climate finance and adaptation space on independent projects. And prior to this, I was at Engro. Um, I have a master's in environmental management from Yale, and um, my undergrad was in engineering from Princeton. So thank you all once again for uh, joining us. Uh, today's event, which is being organized with our partner, uh, the Pakistan Business Council's uh, Center for Excellence in Responsible Business, um, sir, is being co-moderated by myself and uh, Nazish. Um, so please allow me to briefly introduce uh, both Globesite and CERB, which uh, I'm sure most of you already know well. Uh, Globesite is a global development firm working collaboratively with innovative partners to um, craft solutions to some of the world's most pressing issues. With uh, hubs in both New York and Dubai, Globesite has a growing presence across the Middle East, South Asia, and Africa. We advise leading organizations on strategy, uh, research and program operations uh, and help establish partnerships and in, develop innovative business models. Um, Sir, uh, the Pakistan Business Council is the country's premier research-based advocacy body that provides policies, um, promotes policies to sustainably foster the growth of jobs, exports and import substitution. Its outreach initiative, the Center of Excellence in Responsible Business, works towards lifting the capacity of businesses to act responsibly. Um, just before we get started, I want to just introduce some, um, I guess, ground rules for this event. Um, it would be great uh, if you could all keep your mics on mute when not speaking, and please keep your videos on so that we can make this a more interactive discussion. Um, secondly, please, um, you know, if your names are not already uh, mentioned on Zoom, please update your name. Um, so you're not logged in from someone else's account. Uh, and since we have a full table for this event, uh, it would be great if you could keep your contributions uh, concise so that we have a chance to hear from everybody. Uh, and finally, I wanted to let you know that this round table is being recorded and may be broadcast um, at a later date. Uh, so today's event aims to contribute to a better understanding within the private sector of the global climate change agenda, including the move to decarbonization, supply chain resilience and opportunities for climate finance. We also want to highlight and showcase some of the solutions, uh, technology and innovation, which is already occurring within Pakistan's private sector and that could be scaled up uh, possibly across the, the country and even globally uh, to combat climate change. Following COP26, it is clear that the private sector in the global East and South will be of increasing importance to power an effective response to climate change especially in growth countries such as Pakistan. So this roundtable will um, address three broad objectives. Firstly, the broader challenge facing Pakistan due to climate change, including for the economy and corporate sector. Uh, secondly, the opportunity for the private sector to meet this challenge um, with focus on new technologies and innovation that are already occurring in country. And finally, we want to hear from you um, what kind of support and engagement you believe is needed to help mainstream climate change adaptation across the sector. So without further ado, um, to set the stage for the discussion, we'll um, begin with the framing remarks by our esteemed speaker, Mr. Isan Malik. Um, the first segment will focus on opportunity, sorry, opportunities and challenges for the private sector in the post COP26 climate agenda and we'll discuss some of the examples of successful uh, private sector responses to uh, climate challenges in Pakistan. The second segment uh, will be moderated by Ms. Nazi Sheikha and will focus on financing facilities currently available for investing in the climate um, adaptation activities, and then examples of mainstreaming uh, across the private sector in other countries, and we'd like to hear from some of the multilaterals on this as well. Uh, we'll end with a final round of closing remarks and uh, just summing up some of our discussion. So to present uh, the, fr the framing remarks, I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Esan Malik. He's the CEO of Pakistan Business Council since 2016 
and by virtue of that position, a director of the Pakistan Business Council. Prior to this, he was the chief executive officer of Unilever Pakistan and spent a total of 24 years with Unilever in the UK, Egypt, and Sri Lanka. Uh, Mr. Malik is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales and an alumnus of the Wharton and Harvard Business Schools. So Mr. Uh, Isan Malik, uh, please, the uh, uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Maha, and assalamu alaikum, everybody. I'd like to uh, add my warm welcome uh, to this important webinar. Your individual participation is testimony to your personal commitment, as well as, of course, the commitment of your organizations uh, to limit climate change, which we all recognize is one of the most serious risks facing the world. Um, the developing world of which we in Pakistan are a part has for some time been seeking stronger support from the developed world for mitigating actions on climate change. Um, at COP26, though, this turned into a very loud demand for, for, for the developed world to take full responsibility for the harm already caused to the environment. Uh, they were urged to put their money where their mouth is and to fund meaningful action, especially in the developing world. So we are acutely aware that Pakistan is the eighth most vulnerable country to climate change. It therefore needs both mitigative as well as adaptive solutions to the challenges. Uh, the private sector, uh, private sector, sorry, is a key component of a holistic climate strategy, and there is recognition of the severity and the seriousness of the situation that we face. It is also encouraging that more than 26 local companies have signed up to the 1.5 degree centigrade business ambition pledge. Uh, this is this number is significantly higher uh, than some of the larger countries, uh, particularly if you adjust for the difference in size of the economies. So PBC and SERB are really gratified at the response to the various efforts that we've been engaging in with the private sector in the last 12 months or so, in particular. Uh, so investments in renewable energy and efficient resource usage have, have increased, while many companies are also recognizing the need for better disclosure and for risk, manner, uh, risk assessment. Now, a key uh, decision at the COP was the establishment of a work program to urgently scale up mitigation ambition and implementation. A new annual high-level ministerial roundtable on pre-2030 ambition and mitigation will also be kicked off next year to measure progress. Uh, the issue of loss and damage, hitherto neglected as an unimportant side note uh, to the Paris Agreement, emerged as a key decision a key area of discussion at COP26. Despite not being included in the main agenda of the COP, loss and damages saw the most enthusiastic and active deliberations since it was first mentioned in Bali 14 years ago. However, differences over funding and attempts to undermine principles of equity and historic responsibilities threatened to jeopardize the chances of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees centigrade. Now, CERB is proud to collaborate with GlobeSight, a global development firm working jointly with their innovative partners to craft solutions to the world's most pressing social needs. I would also like to commend all the participating organizations for their time and input. It is particularly encouraging to note that most companies present here today are PVC members, underlining the need for large and more successful businesses in Pakistan, which of course comprise PVC's membership to also lead by example on integrating climate ambition as a key pillar. So with that, I hand you back to Maha. Maha, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. San Malik, for your um, insightful comments. Um, I'd now like to introduce Ms. Nazish Shrefa, who's leading the second segment. Uh, Nazish currently heads the research hub of CERN. Uh, she has previously worked in both the private and the development sector, including establishing a Karachi-centric skill-based volunteering program she has taught at NED, uh, at the Indus Valley School of Art and Architecture, and at Zabist. Uh, Nazish has an MSc in Poverty Reduction Policy and Practice with a specialization in Natural Resource Management from SOAS London and an undergraduate degree in Environmental Sciences from King's College. Um, I guess we can now uh, move to our first segment, uh, Post-COP26 Opportunities and Challenges for the Private Sector. So we'd like to start by taking stock of what the current global climate change landscape looks like post COP26. Uh, the classical climate pact called for the first ever phase down of unabated coal. It witnessed commitments by governments and the private sector on building climate resilience 
um, in terms of infrastructure and also recognized the critical role of restoring nature and ecosystems in delivering benefits for climate adaptation. There has also been a global push towards um, supply chain decarbonization, uh, supply chain resilience. Uh, and as Mr. Esan Malik mentioned, many companies have also announced uh, net zero targets and are moving towards a certain business model. Um, so I'd like to hear from um, all of you now, actually, um, on what climate change uh, means for your particular company and organization. What are the, some, some of the implications of climate change for your um, current business model? Um, and, you know, anyone can, can respond to this or I can call upon somebody. Um, Um, okay, I mean, if you want, I can, I can, I can take the lead. Sure, thank you, Marcel. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah, so I'm Hamad Nagy, the Chief Executive of WWF, the largest environmental organization. Uh, uh, I, I think, as uh, uh, Sansa mentioned, uh, we are a vulnerable country. For us, climate change is water change. Um, the water has a very important role in an economy. Uh, and then when we have to consider, uh, you know, or between the mitigation and adaptation, for us, I think adaptation is the key because of the, the impacts, if you look at the impacts in different sectors. So we, uh, mitigation, obviously we need, to, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, particularly the private sector. The problem is, uh, and, uh, Coming back to Maha, your question, I'm not talking about, you know, my organization or the implication. I'm talking about the experience and, you know, our assessment of, uh, you know, working the private sector and also other sectors. What, where do we see the gaps, you know, what we feel, uh, the, the, some of the businesses, you know, they're taking actions, but a lot, uh, they are unfortunately not taking uh, action. Uh, the main problem is that most businesses, they do not, uh, they're not aware of their greenhouse gas emissions or their carbon footprint. That's the, and then if you look at the capacity within, you know, the, the government, but the public sector and the private sector to really assess that, we also see that there's a, there's a, there's a big gap. Uh, so uh, the, some of the, the, the global uh, corporations, some of the, the progressive businesses primarily who cater for export market, you know, they export their services or products. Uh, they proactively, you know, have taken steps to reduce their carbon footprint. Um, they have set their targets. Sometimes the targets are conveyed through their global headquarters, like companies like Unilever, which Hassan, you know, uh, has been serving for, for quite some time. Um, oil and gas sector, uh, food and beverage uh, companies. But then the, some of the local companies, their buyers, you know, want them to, uh, to do a certain service. Another tendency which we see is where uh, sometimes companies without, you know, or maybe ignoring their own operations and bringing changes of improvement within their own operations, sometimes they feel more comfortable or convenient to support, you know, um, uh, plantation activities or other CSR activities to, to, to maybe demonstrate sometimes in a very general manner, but sometimes just, you know, uh, for the heck of it, uh, that they are reducing uh, their, their carbon footprint. That's the, the, the second area. The third is, if you look at the supportive framework, uh, the government introduced, you know, uh, the green, uh, the financing line, particularly for renewables. Um, the interest rate is, 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 is much lower than, you know, the conventional uh, financing. And that's where we saw a lot of, you know, improvement. We had companies going for, suppose for solar, I mean, Usman is here from Sky Electric. He would, you know, know much better that uh, where companies like, you know, even Procter and Gamble, Unilever, a lot of others, through their banking partners, you know, uh, introducing renewable energy 
uh, in their in their uh, operation. So uh, that's that's the the situation. I would uh, I would just you know uh, talking about opportunities. I would like to to share that there are so many other opportunities which the Pakistani private sector can utilize. I mean, as WWF, I can mention at least three which we are trying to promote. There's a Dutch Fund for Climate and Development, DFCD. Uh, they want to help the entrepreneurs, you know, to come up with ideas which are, you know, environment friendly and cl uh, climate friendly or climate smart. So it took us a couple of years to sensitize the, the local corporate sector to, you know, explore that and go for that. Now, the good thing is that the three, four uh, proposals which have been approved. The second is uh, another facility, which is in German, the NAMA. We also, you know, as an organization launched that. That's where particularly addressing the textile sector. So there, there are funds available, which will help, you know, by utilizing them, they can do two things, the, the, the textile sector. Uh, introduce renewables or improve their energy efficiency, the way, you know, they manufacture uh, certain products. So just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll stop here that, uh, you know, just sharing some of the experiences uh, that we, uh, you know, had as part of our corporate engagement and as part of our climate and energy program. Over. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marisa. Um, would you like to maybe respond to that with some examples of um, how Engro is being impacted and what kind of um, sustainability uh, measures um, you're taking across the organization um, to respond to some of these challenges? Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Maha. And uh, uh, Hamad, thank you also for uh, mentioning the Plantation Drive. Uh, WWF is our uh, proud partner in uh, the project that we uh, are about to kick off. Um, uh, this is a large scale uh, uh, tree plantation forest um, protection uh, meant for uh, offsetting you know, carbon footprint of some of our businesses. So at Engro, um, we are in the process of, uh, you know, uh, let's say developing our sustainability strategy. Um, I wouldn't say that we have um, completed the process, uh, but it already has, you know, kicked start uh, quite a few interventions that, uh, you know, are supposed to be part of any strategy, the way, whatever, you know, it is finalized. Um, so one of them is, uh, you know, this uh, path on the offset. Um, of course, offset is not straight away that we have got to move to offset. We are looking at uh, the manufacturing processes of our different companies also. So the, the, the engineering teams at manufacturing plants are looking at uh, opportunities to reduce the uh, carbon footprint as well as water footprint. And uh, we're looking at um, uh, changing the energy mix of our uh, businesses also. So, uh, you know, look at uh, the uh, energy mix and, and uh, you know, introducing more renewables. So that part is being done by, uh, you know, plant-based uh, teams. Uh, naturally, it's more technical. And uh, based on, you know, uh, estimates and calculations, uh, the remaining part is where we are going for offsets. It's not, offset is not just, uh, you know, uh, the only thing that has been done. Uh, apart from this, um, we are also, um, you know, embarking upon a um, uh, program to bring in uh, principles of circular economy in uh, our plastics business. Uh, plastics, as we know, is a big issue uh, in terms of uh, environment uh, and, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's affecting um, uh, various ecosystems disproportionately. So uh, we are aiming to uh, study the waste supply chain and, uh, you know, bring, bring that, um, you know, formal data information around uh, uh, waste supply chain, which is mostly being handled by informal channels right now. And uh, an experiment with some models to figure out, uh, you know, let's say, leading to sort of behavior change about let's say for example uh, segregation at source uh, as well as looking at opportunities around uh, you know uh, uh, mechanical as well as chemical recycling uh, so all these you know uh, different um, let's say potential interventions under our uh, circular plastics program are also something that we are looking at um, uh, we, we are hoping that uh, as we move along uh, uh, these uh, you know different initiatives uh, will generate some internal um, uh, momentum also. Um, you know, Agro is quite diversified. We have like multiple businesses and, uh, you know, everybody's on a different learning curve also. Uh, so so that's, that's something that um, uh, we're hoping that it's going to translate into 
uh, let's say more um, each individual company wide uh, specific targets and uh, and it's being linked with the uh, individual uh, you know uh, objectives and, and uh, the performance management system also so looking at all these elements i uh, we are very hopeful that uh, we will have a very robust uh, program around uh, you know uh, looking at our footprint and how to manage it thank you Thanks so much for one. Um, I guess just one quick question I had was what kind of approach you um, took towards developing your sustainability strategy? Was it more of a bottom up approach, subsidiary wise, or was it more of a um, you know, top down, um, central led approach? Um, how are you kind of going about so, doing so, the actual footprint? So, Maha, Maha, in, a, in a diversified uh, conglomerate, you know, the ideas you know, pop up at you know, different spots. So, I wouldn't completely rule out that there was, uh, you know, great motivation uh, uh, at the employee level. Also, there was, you know, bottoms up um, uh, ideas that were sort of um, uh, coming across uh, uh, the leadership, and uh, perhaps it required definitely a more coherent strategy. Uh, so that, um, if you just take that part into account, then it's clearly, you know, top down, uh, uh, you know, uh, view that is there. So right now. Um, uh, what has been done is that at holding company at corporation level, um, it has been consolidated and it will sort of bring uh, the early adopters and the laggards also all, all of them together. So while there was some, you know, bottoms up thing that was evolving in different uh, individual subsidiaries, now it has been sort of taken up as a more uh, coherent strategy and will uh, be applied uniform across uh, different uh, subsidiaries. Excellent. Good to hear. Um, I think somebody has their mic on and there's a bit of an echo, so we'll all just keep your mics off the yeah. helpful. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I just want to add something. It's very uh, interesting discussions going on. I am Akib Zoho from Dalda Foods. Uh, actually, it is very good to, uh, to summarize that we have to do the two steps. We we have to do the mitigations. We have to adopt ourselves in the changing climatic situations. It is very good, but it is not as per the interest of the business organization. Uh, Sir Hassan Malik may uh, uh, second me. Business organization always step the steps when their ROI is needs. So if we, I, if someone asks. Well, I, I will go on the mitigation. I will say it is much more important for me to adopt the situation or to adopt the my organization in the climate changing situations so that I can propel my business without any hiccups. And what actually is happening in the uh, in the Pakistan, increasing heat waves, what we can do, how can we sustain our business, how can we continue the uh, supply chain uh, going on inside the organization when the uh, so much snowfall, uh, monsoon, uh, and uh, rainfall uh, occurred. What will be the situation of the operations? How can we manufacture the food for our consumer? So the sustainability of the business should be correlated with the uh, with the uh, uh, with the commitments to uh, private of a private sector to the uh, government and then the government should commit it to the global organizations so whatever actually is happening in the uh, actually is happening is the synchronization of the business uh, activities with the adaptation in this climatic change environment in such a situation for example uh, as uh, hamas have said that uh, some uh, prominent M NMCs are doing and the local companies have no consideration on it. I think it is not, it is the sense of the responsibility. Uh, for example, in Dalda Food, we are ourselves uh, moving a full flash uh, HSC department reporting to the CEO and uh, they are actually uh, uh, forcing us to reduce the carbon footprint by, you know, by adopting, adapting the uh, most advanced technology. For example, we are using the boiler having economizers so that the uh, emissions can be controlled. Even our emissions is such as controlled that their limits are much more below than the allowable limit of the SEQS. So it is this. Uh, uh, it is the behavior of a responsible organization, rather it is the differentiated into the local or the MNCs. 
that is what we actually i feel that should be added in the discussion <laughs> Thank you so much for your perspective, uh, Akib Saab, uh, and noted about your point about you know having support from the government as well um, to help mainstream some of these initiatives. Um, Hamad Saab has his hand up, so if uh, Hamad Bashir, so if, if you'd like to respond to this, um, yes. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank. thank you. Thank Sorry. Uh, thank you, Ms. Ma. Uh, a brief introduction of uh, myself and my organization. Uh, my name is uh, Hamad Bashir. I'm working with UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, which name itself is self-explanatory. It's part of United Nations, working for industrial development. Within the industrial development, our main focus area is sustainable energy and environment. Hamad, we are sorry, excuse me. Sorry. sorry to interrupt. Um, Timur, I think your mic is on. And yeah, Timur's mic is on. If you could keep turning it off, uh, that would Thank you so much. Please continue. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I was giving introduction of my organization. Uh, I'm working at, with the uh, UNIDO, United Nations Industrial Development Organization, which is name itself is self-explanatory. It's part of United Nations, working for industrial development, primarily in developing countries around the world. And one of the focus area or thematic area in which UNIDO is working is sustainable energy environment. So what we are looking at sustainable energy environment is our current project, which is called PFAN, Private Finance Advisory Network. We are supporting the local industries in raising financing for their clean energy products and when we say clean energy it includes all renewable energy products it includes energy efficiency related products it includes circular economy related products so if the industries like the akib Saab has mentioned if they want to do some activity which is climate friendly which comes under the domain of circular economy which is renewable energy which is related to clean energy or any other related facets of clean energy will support them we'll provide our services and our services include working with the industries and working with the documentation of the industries to make it presentable to the financial institution there and all the cost of making this documentation that is financial modeling and improving your numbers and connecting you with the financial institution, that cost would be borne by our project. So at this esteem forum uh, of Dope site and the SERP, I would uh, request all of you that if you have any projects, we are here to support your projects and getting, helping you raising financing for your clean energy products and all those projects that results in less, in, less emission of carbon. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you so much, Matsa. Um, so again, that's I think it's a very interesting um, uh, new kind of initiative that you uh, presented, and I'm sure some of these companies will benefit from that. Um, I'd like to now call upon um, Mustafa from Surti, and uh, after that, I'd like to hear from Usman Sefla Saab, who's one of the head of uh, Pakistan's, you know, uh, one of the largest renewable energy companies. Uh, so, Mustafa, uh, over to you. I um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So I, I, I mean, this was like this is an amazing initiative. But uh, one of the things that I just wanted to add to this is that renewable energy is also a very tough choice to make for organizations right now. Thermal or solar energy do not give you a lot of. Um, uh, energy percentage wise uh, it's also initial it initially the investment expensive, and I know that the programs from the government and other private bodies that are also there but then it, it can't be a very reliable source for you know heavy industries heavy energy intensive industries similarly biomass has a huge scope three emission to it and um, that is something that we're also struggling with and we are a agriculture based country where biomass is a fodder crop as well so we can't be taking that away from the country as well we're practically feeding one son with the same crop as well um, so let us be very clear on what are those renewable energy initiatives that we're talking about and um, <clears throat> what would be the best choice right now we can't have everyone going on biomass and of course thermal i still believe you know we just don't have enough space especially for mills like Karachi 
uh, it's a vertical mill generally so you don't have enough space for that but having said so yes i think uh, it is high time we invest in this uh, we should have done this much earlier because the government won't be taking much initiative even in the future but if we do this uh, i would also like to propose collaborative projects uh, between industries between um, entities which could sort of not only share the financial load but also the strategic project loads between each other so i think that should help uh, to and i would just be wondering what maybe usa and um, these other companies are doing in terms of uh, you know what are those renewable energy projects uh, that uh, should be the future uh, that is what we should be adopting to thank you my two friends i guess thank you uh, thank you mr pai thank you all for very important point in a uh, city like karachi for example which is so urbanized and space is a constraint so it is difficult to put up um, you know massive utility scale um, you know renewable energy plants um it is it's uh, a valid point uh, about biomass as well but yes it has a huge scope to emissions footprint um i'd now like to invite uh, usman safulas up to uh, please uh, respond to this uh, since you're the renewable energy expert here uh, ji assalam alaikum uh, maha can you hear me yes we can hear you i can read that thank you uh, and uh, thank you asan saab for your opening remarks and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, i can uh, i am not a subject matter specialist so i can i can only talk about my role as a uh, you know as 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 a ceo of, of a solar company uh, but in general i tend to agree with uh, akib saab's point that uh, any solution uh, you can't really ultimately rely on sort of um, you know altruistic motives uh, it has to make at the end of the day it has to it's the profit motive that that is at work for businesses and uh, speaking for my industry solar i think uh, over the last few years the you know uh, confluence of factors the technology the uh, increasing price of fossil fuels in pakistan the depreciating rupee all of these uh, factors have sort of led to a situation where solar is quite competitive with the alternatives and of course it is a cleaner and better alternative the challenge of course is that it's a long uh, it's a long life uh, long lived asset so the and uh, you basically lock in your power cost your 20 year power cost you have to pay for it up front so financing is very important and i can see that uh, some of our partner banks the js bank is on the call uh, the state banks uh, re, you know uh, uh, the, um, the the finance policy for the end user i think is is a very good policy Uh, the adopt uh, uh, you know uh, banks have been sort of patchy in picking it up uh, banks look again banks look at the profit motive if the housing sector is more attractive they will go there yeah, so uh, so th that has been a challenge but um, but really i think uh, in in the four uh, we have been in business for about four years uh, in pakistan i think very much all the factors that you need to push the and i speak for largely for the residential sector to uh, push them towards adoption of solar energy i think all those factors are there and really what we need actually is the government to stay out of the way rather than any particular uh, you know benefit we want want from them and actually also the government doesn't believe as far as the frankly the government doesn't believe in distributed solar when they think about solar they think of 200 megawatt one you know one uh, huge projects ipp scale projects they don't believe that uh, panel you know panels on rooftops are going to solve our uh, our, our problems and uh, so so the first thing is that everyone on this call and to the extent that we can influence and we have the ear of the ear of people in government they have to start believing that this is part of the solution to our problems um, as i said uh, fossil fuel prices the rupee depreciating these are all helping uh, the problem is creating its own solution um some of the challenges that we we faced you know uh, i mentioned financial um if you are a new there are lots of small solar companies if you are a new solar company it's very difficult to get financing for working capital to grow your business
making us a Pakistan a manufacturing hub. And the PBC is doing, uh, playing a big role in, in this effort. But in today's world, if you want to do manufacturing, you have to work with, uh, you have a global supply chain and you have to work with contract manufacturers in other countries. Now, if in Pakistan, you can't make an advance payment beyond $10,000, you know, that, that creates lots of challenges uh, linking us into, uh, so what, Park, what we end uh, up doing in, in, in Sky Electric is that we have outsourced the assembly of our product to outside Pakistan and all the software development and the IP and the engineering is done in Pakistan. We would love to manufacture this in Pakistan also, but you know, you need regulatory changes. Um, so regulatory changes is, uh, you know, are, are very important. If I, was, uh, uh, if I was in the business of selling diesel generators for homes or gas generators, I would be less regulated than I am currently. So as uh, I can just pick up, get into the business of selling, you know, uh, 50 kVA generators, I don't think I would be regulated. But as a solar company, I need to go to AADB, I need to go to Pakistan Engineering Council. And uh, I, we understand these are early days for, for the industry. And uh, to give uh, the EEDB and Engineering Council, they are, uh, uh, we, we are seeing continuous improvement and effort and willingness from their side. But regulatory, you know, removing cumbersome regulations is the other thing uh, that, we, that we need uh, to do. And finally, uh, you know, when you get into new businesses, you always, there is, the uh, there is the issue of talent. And this is a good problem to have because it's exciting to see, you know, you are creating jobs for firmware engineers, for software engineers, for hardware engineers, and the um, the, the the availability is 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 uh, is challenging. Uh, but as more and more industries, uh, businesses get into these industries, the talent pool will also grow. So um, you know these challenges will will uh, will be seen. But um, you know, thank you once again. I'm I'm glad that you are uh, you have arranged this roundtable and. Uh, uh, you know, we as a company remain uh, happy to contribute in any way that we can towards our, uh, our shared goals. So thank you once again. Thank you so much. Uh, also, I think you highlighted some very pertinent points, especially around regulation by the government. Uh, you know, I, I think that's a challenge that a lot of companies face locally in you know, startups. So the point is noted. Um, I'd like yes. to... Um, to speak, um, just, uh, we'd like to hear from you actually hear more about some examples from uh, drawdown farms and the kind of work you're doing in regenerative agriculture. Yes. Ma Sorry, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, Maha, Asalaamu Alaikum everyone. Uh, it's a great privilege to be here and speaking to you all today on what I believe is the most important topic that we should all be discussing, which is uh, the series of interrelated crises which impact the world and Pakistan. Uh, and these include, of course, climate change, but very closely linked to it is the sixth mass extinction, which is a global biodiversity crisis. Um, and uh, we also have a major pollution crisis, which includes uh, plastic waste. So uh, the work that I do <clears throat> currently is in regenerative agriculture. I was uh, um, uh, privileged to be the pioneer of bringing regenerative agriculture to Pakistan. About uh, five, six years ago, uh, we started this journey. At the time, this was uh, something that was not very known at all in the world. Now, of course, all the big companies in the world, Unilever, Nestle just came out with their Regen Ag policy, Pepsi, they all now have Regen Ag policies because anyone with an agricultural supply chain, um, if they want to survive and thrive in this era, has to move towards Regen Ag. So uh, one of the things that uh, Mr. Hamad Khan of the WWF mentioned was that as a country, we have to adapt um, and not so much mitigate, but I would, in my humble a contention uh, sort of slightly disagree because I believe that we can and must also have a role to play in mitigation. In fact, Pakistan can be a pioneering country uh, in this regard. Uh, regenerative agriculture has the policy to sequester, has the ability to sequester all the excess carbon that's in the atmosphere, which is uh, the core cause of climate change and put it in the soils through a series of techniques um, which uh, can actually, in time, lead to higher yields, more disease and pest resistance, 
uh, and also provide an adaptation to climate change and ultimately of course be a solution if done on a large enough scale. And there are a lot of studies which showcase this. Uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize of, of, of Food and, and Agriculture uh, was given last year to Professor Ratan Lal, who is uh, the world's, uh, he's a pioneering soil scientist at the University of Ohio. And he has done some incredible calculations and, uh, and showcased that the majority of the carbon in the atmosphere is actually from degradation of lands all over the world, so deforestation, but also the destruction of soils, which were rich in carbon with modern agriculture, uh, which was very degenerative with heavy tilling, lots of chemicals, all of that released carbon into the atmosphere. And so there's more carbon in the atmosphere from that than there is from the burning of fossil fuels. Um, and this in turn showcases the possibilities with things like a global initiative for having one trillion trees, protecting forests and peatlands, but also with agriculture. Um, and so specifically talking about drawdown farm and some of the techniques that we have deployed, we take what I call an integrative regenerative agriculture approach. So what um, I did was that uh, I went and looked at all of uh, the incredible um, innovations that were happening in the world uh, farmers in Australia, in the United States, in Latin America, Europe, um, even some in Asia. And what were the things that they were doing that were harnessing biology and ecology uh, in achieving the goals that they, uh, that they wanted to achieve? Uh, and so whatever was applicable in, in Pakistan, in our context, I tried to bring and, and implement. Um, and so we got our teams trained. I, I hired a bunch of agronomists, I myself, uh, went uh, and met up with a bunch of experts. Uh, we learned from a bunch of experts like uh, the world's leading soil microbiologist. Um, we actually, you know, literally um, uh, hired many people to teach us many things. So we make the largest compost manufacturing facility in all of Pakistan is on our farm. And, uh, uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of science involved, so quality matters tremendously because two composts can be called compost, but it, they can have um, uh, enormous differences in their quality. So fungally dominant composts are, are very important. So we look under the microscope to, to see the quality specs. Um, then we're doing biochar. We have the largest biochar manufacturing in the country. Uh, biochar is an incredible tool uh, because uh, one of the August speakers today spoke about biomass in this country. And uh, biomass for energy is something that I'm not particularly keen on. I agree with the previous speaker because there are so many other better uses. There's, of course, the fodder element, but of course, there's composts, which are uh, you know, a key kickstarter towards regenerative agriculture, and then this biochar, because biochar, when it goes into the soil, Pakistani soils have very poor water holding capacity. So we can dramatically enhance the amount of water that our soils can hold. At Rodan Farm, in some of our acreages, we are using 90% less water in our very sandy soils than the Pakistani average, which uses flood irrigation. And that's um, uh, through the usage of certain irrigation technologies, but also by building our soil. So a carbonaceous soil is very spongy. It can hold water after a rain event, after you water it and irrigate it. And this has enormous savings for a farmer because a lot of times watering has costs because you're pumping from an aquifer or pumping from a canal. But also it, it allows your, it makes you resilient to climate shocks. In our industry, and Ma, you start off with this question, what is the crisis that your industry is already facing with climate change? And so in 2019, we had a, an insane hailstorm events in the Punjab, which dramatically affected Pakistan's wheat crop, which is why wheat prices went through the roof in 2019-2020 season. Then we had a locust problem, which most people don't know is a climate change problem. So in the Rubb al Khali, which is the empty quarter, the big desert in Saudi Arabia, we had freak rain events, uh, which actually led to much more greening that happens than is normally uh, the case with these monsoon rains that happen in the Rubb al Khali. And because of that, you had a mushrooming of grasshopper populations, which morphed and metastasized into locusts. So grasshoppers become locusts. Many people don't know this. And then locusts have very different habits from grasshoppers. 
And then they created these swarms. They went to East Africa first, then through the Middle East, through Iran, and into Pakistan. So, and this type of stuff, these kinds of shock events are going to increase with each passing year. In fact, most people don't know this, but the Syrian civil war is a direct consequence of climate change. From 2006 to 10, you had the largest drought in the history of Syria, which caused 2 million farmers to lose 60% of their crops, 80% of their livestock. So they moved to the cities because they were jobless. And in the cities, of course, they didn't have jobs and services waiting for them. So then they started protesting and a gov an authoritarian government tried to crush them. And of course, you know, they had nowhere, you know, nothing to lose, if you will. And the entire country erupted into a civil war. So climate change is a massive national security threat. And uh, the new NSP document that the government of Pakistan launched, the national security policy, I went through it. And unfortunately, climate change is, is very low on the priority list. Thankfully, it made the cut. Uh, but there's no mention of the plastics crisis or the air pollution crisis um, and, the, and the biodiversity crisis. And these are all linked and they have to be front and center. And if business does not take the bull by the horns, then there won't be a future case for business. So uh, very quickly, I'll just end with, uh, you know, because Mr. Malik uh, started, kicked off this event uh, for Unilever and Paul Pullman was the CEO in all probabilities when he was, uh, you know, when he had it, Pakistan's Unilever, Mr. Malik did. Uh, Paul Pullman had a big role to play in shifting uh, Unilever. And his latest book, um, Net Positive, is an excellent read, which I would humbly request every one of the panelists here to go through. And he narrates the case uh, of Mayo versus Ketchup is the first chapter, which is really about Unilever uh, versus Kraft and the trajectories of their stocks because Kraft was the kind of company which was obsessed with the bottom line now, whereas Unilever, uh, there they were obsessed with the bottom line, not just now, but also in the future. And so they made a series of strategic maneuvers, which, and you can see the cleavage in the stock prices between both countries, between both companies, which is huge because uh, Kraft was owned by, uh, I won't get into the granular details, by a private equity company which is known for, uh, for very short-term thinking, for cutting costs, uh, but in the long run, those companies tend to suffer. So uh, <clears throat> this is essential. And so Mr. Arkeb from Dalda, uh, when he said that the bottom line matters, while that's true, but a company has to have a strategic vision, and especially companies that are doing well for themselves, like Dalda is, they have to invest into uh, to ensure that they have a, a future because with the advent of esg um, and that lens raising financing for example green bonds becomes so much easier when you have sustainability baked into or regenerative business or net positive business baked into the framework of business and so in the consulting work that i do for businesses um, I also am a, a regenerative business consultant for a textile uh, company in, in Pakistan. Uh, this is uh, the core case that I make because if you do not invest now as a company, it's very difficult for you to have a, a future. Um, and, and of course, if you're an exporter, that's definitely the case. But also for companies, for big companies who are publicly listed that are in this uh, market that, that cater to the domestic audience, even for them raising financing in the future is going to be much, much easier if they have that lens on. And I know I've uh, taken a lot of time, so I'm going to pass the mic over, but um, if there are any follow-up questions for me in, in terms of Regen Ag or anything else, please, uh, I'll be more than glad to answer. Thank you so much, Timur, um, for your comments. And this brings us actually to our second segment. Um, I'd like to uh, hand it over now to Nazi Shrika. Um, and we'd like to call upon, I guess, some of our finance experts here um, to uh, bring their perspective to the conversation. So over to you, Nazish. Thank you, Maha. Um, it's really interesting to hear all of uh, everybody's thoughts. Um, I'd like to first, um, I, I see, I've seen Mr. Verinder. He's had his hand up. If you'd like to respond to a lot of things that have been talked about by Temu, it would be great. And then I'm gonna I'm gonna handle uh, ask the finance uh, look at the financing options for you know climate ad adaptation and mitigation. Yes, thank you, Nazish. I just want to uh, add to all the speakers a few of uh, questions which arose uh, from the everybody's points. I collected them. Dalda is actually investing now whether it's a green initiative for tree plantation 
whether it's uh, farmer initiative for introducing crops which consume less water and also the buyback policy from the industry which ultimately support the farmers to come in the, into the business of uh, green initiative in pakistan well coming back to the uh, water footprint of pakistan of course we are water deficient country and in future we may also face difficulties in having water for our crops and even for drinking for this dalda has also initiated uh, education of farmers for uh, introducing high efficiency irrigation systems at dalda's own research farm which is one of the initiative you can visit at farm it's is called dalda foods agriculture research station near garo town so at any anybody can visit that farm and you can see physically how we are contributing in pakistan's economy with respect to farmers education with respect to green initiative and with respect to energy conservation because of course uh, unlike mr temur malik he also highlighted that uh, reducing the uh, chemical use and increasing the bio uses bio sources of fertilizers in the uh, crop uh, supplements it is uh, one of the important factor which may reduce our uh pollution and, and all energy constraints which we are nowadays facing so i think that's a great initiative by mr taimur malik and mr usman sepul who introduced solar because uh, at aldas farm whatever the energy we are using is all based on solar and whenever every year 50, 35 farmers come to visit us as a part of our training they always ask the question how do we generate our electricity in the far most areas where there is no electricity the far most easy answer for us is to uh, convey them that solar is easy and adaptable solution so this is all about uh, dalda's initiative on agriculture okay thank you verinder um so now um let's uh move the talk towards you know what sort of uh, finances and what sort of uh support do organizations today require uh to scale up climate change mitigation and adaptation and what are the options for it um i'd like to um uh ask uh mr farhan anwar and uh, or um i can't see him anymore um the person from js bank uh to respond to, the, to this uh, are you seeing any uh is there any opportunities to finance uh, areas where you feel people are talking about climate change uh, good evening everyone uh, my name is farhan and i am uh, basically representing bank alfala on this platform uh, i work for uh, investment banking team at alfala and we are proud to say that you know alfala is one of the leading banks who who is financing actively in the renewable space uh as far as you know as well as far as various financing options are concerned uh, under the renewable energy so basically state bank in 2017 18 had introduced a subsidized financing scheme which was called the state bank of pakistan's renewable energy scheme under which uh, under which different businesses you know can uh, can avail funding from banks uh, at very subsidized rates the rates go as low as uh, 6% so which is very feasible and convenient for the for for the for different businesses to 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 install captive you know solar projects within their premises as alpha uh, different banks have different uh, facilities or quotas allotted under the under their subsidized financing bank alfala is proud to say that you know so far out of the allotted quota we have disbursed more than 80% of that uh, we have disbursed more than 80% of the finance of, of the of the allocation available to the bank from state banks windows most of the projects that we finance uh, are uh, are in the wind are in the wind solar wind power sector we have financed distributed solar projects uh, our, our bank is very active in you know allowing subsidized financing to individuals who want to install solar power projects uh, on their rooftops so so, so the most convenient and the and the cheapest option available at this point in time to to for the businesses to avail uh, to 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 promote or to install you know renewable financing renewable 
energy in their businesses is through the state bank's uh, renewable energy scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you, um, uh, Mr. Ali Hassan. Would you like to um, comment on that? I think you're on mute. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Uh, so just to building on to what uh, Mr. Farhan said uh, from Bangalore, yes, the renewable energy scheme is one of the most uh, prominent activities that we see being used as financing. Um, similar to uh, Bangalore, we also have pretty much almost exhausted our entire allocation and quota uh, of the renewable energy scheme. But, but we see that um, e even even with our initiative and Bank Alpha's initiative, I don't think we've any, even begun to scratch the surface uh, of what is possible. Spe specifically, what something that Mr. Osman said, the distributed the the distributed grid future that we may hold, and the potential that we have, given that we have significantly higher irrigation levels, and the capacity that we can potentially reach with this scheme. Uh, the scheme is yes an introduction and is a start and is probably going to convince financial institutions which are generally more um, safety oriented or risk oriented uh, to take or start considering solar or renewable energy assets as hard collateral which we started to see in the uh, which we started to see and in the future we hope that that will become a uh, sort of a factor that will probably change how we perceive renewable energy and we see rooftop financing taking a major share in the future because we, we the the commodity prices are not going to come, come down and 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 if that is if that remains full sector and specifically solar we do see a lot of future in the in that space coming up to the initiatives that other financial institutions are i can't i can't say about all the financial institutions but some of the initiatives that we've taken in the uh, and we are taking right Back investments in, in the country. What we hope to achieve from this is a, is an initiative from other stakeholders to do the same thing. Uh, we don't want to be the only one in this forum being accredited by the Green Climate Fund or uh, or mobilizing projects from ex, uh, from foreign donor agencies to mobilize climate financing in Pakistan. We want other stakeholders to also develop this skill and the capacity that is required. Uh, to, to be able to attain this financing. There are significant barriers into getting this sort of financing. Uh, first of all, understanding climate change. Uh, we lack uh, capacity in terms of understanding and how to, how to be able to uh, get financing for, the, for such solutions. For solar, it is far simpler. For something that Mr. Tembur talked about, it's far more um, uh, complicated. And, and to be frank, uh, there, there's a lot of capacity building and collaboration that we need to do as, as, this, as, as this forum is doing uh, to work on that. But it's more important to realize where, where we need to direct our uh, initiatives. Uh, being we, as a country, we don't produce a lot of emissions. We suffer the rats, but as, uh, and, and we may be producing a lot of emissions in the future but okay. we need to understand our own footprint and rationalize where what are our focus areas as far as i understand half of our emissions come from um, IPPs and thermal thermal generation so that and and the indc's has a specific mandate to to to, uh, to take us to 60 percent renewable energy by 2030 yeah. that's enough of a vision to keep all of us focused on that uh, on that dream. So, okay. so okay, we need to just, yeah, so that's about it. Okay, thank you, Ali. Um, I just now like to turn to uh, the private sector.
registered companies here. So what's, we've talked about the support that the banking sector is giving at the moment. So what other support do you think is required to scale up climate mitigation and adaptation in Pakistan? You know, um, and what would be the enabling environment for that? Um, shall we start with um, Pavad, if you would like to add something on that? Oh, okay, I'm, I'll, I'll give it a try. Um, so, of course, I mean, um, uh, like um, uh, Alice uh, talked about, you know, uh, the capacity around being able to capitalize on financial opportunities. Um, we, at one point in time, tried to uh, work uh, uh, with, uh, you know, potentially a Green Climate Fund application, and uh, that's where we struggled a lot in terms of uh, just making sense of it. It's, there's so many layers to it. There's so many, um, I don't know, I mean, I, I can't even uh, potentially explain because I didn't get most of those constraints and it was so difficult to access it. Uh, we've, you know, in our conversations, I've raised it with, uh, you know, different UN organizations also to sort of make it more simple. Thank God um, uh, Ali's organization is accredited and uh, it has kind of uh, reduced that uh, requirement uh, to apply directly to GCF. Uh, but of course, I mean, uh, access to finance is um, is one challenge um, that um, remains, uh, you know, far and fewer opportunities, I would say. Um, uh, other than that, of course, I mean, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, the changes that uh, a holistic view on uh, climate change adaptability that uh, would bring in, in the value chains, I mean, it's a lot of uh, you know risks that potentially come in with uh, those change practices are still sort of undocumented in Pakistani context. So you can't really go out and suddenly you know start converting your entire value chain without having uh, um, a thorough risk assessment, for example. Uh, so I would imagine that that would uh, be uh, sort of a, a, a constraint on uh, uh, let's say quick adaptability. So uh, I, I mean. Um, so in a diverse, uh, let's say, organization, a big organization where uh, uh, people in uh, functions like foundation, for example, people like me, uh, we have uh, you know this easier uh, position to promote uh, you know these progressive practices. But I can imagine the ones that are uh, at the forefront of let's say uh, achieving the targets, the procurement targets, or uh, you know uh, you know uh, logistics and uh, everything that, that sort of um, feeds into the core business um they uh the ease uh, the, uh, you know the, uh, the kind of environment they have been operating with and uh suddenly moving on to something which is many unknowns associated with it i think that will be serious uh, reluctance on it i don't know how best to uh, sort of um overcome those overnight and uh or maybe i can imagine it would be a slow process of uh, you know awareness and sort of uh, realization that is happening at it's, it's uh, you know pace that it is happening at but of course, it's not enough, and um, that I think is something where perhaps some sort of um, networking or um, you know capacity building of um, uh, people in the core functions of the businesses uh, could be of help. Um, yeah, that's that's all I can think of at this moment. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Fawad. Um, I'd like to now ask Ali Fessel. He's joined us from Jazz. Uh, so if you could, uh, if there are any activities that Jazz is doing, uh, perhaps related to innovation or telecommunication, uh, related to climate action, uh, perhaps in the agricultural space uh, or other spaces, if you could uh, tell us what, uh, what is your take on this uh, climate action, basically. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think uh, so far it's been a very fruitful discussion and very informative as well. Uh, so Jazz, uh, as you know, uh, Jazz is not at uh, perhaps at the forefront of. Uh, sorry, Ali, you I, we can't hear you. Your uh, voice is suddenly can you, sort of muted. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. So uh, I was explaining that uh, jazz is perhaps not a very big contributor when it comes to uh, pollution or uh, our biggest consumption is electricity, which is also not very significant. But uh, despite that, uh, we believe, 
and we have committed to zero emissions by 2050. And uh, I think that itself is a very big pledge uh, on our part. And um, other than that, uh, within the office, we have uh, reduced or are trying to reduce our energy consumption further. And uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, these are very small steps but uh, we've uh, almost eliminated the use of paper and uh, gone completely digital. Uh, paper is only used when necessary, necessarily required externally, otherwise within the organization, it, there's uh, zero use of paper. So mm -hmm. these are very small steps that we've done, but I think they, uh, every step counts and uh, whatever we can do, wherever we can do, uh, we are doing it. In terms of, uh, I think, uh, another step that the industry has taken is uh, using shared towers. So one aspect, I think, visual pollution and also perhaps in terms of physical footprint are the telecom towers that you see uh, dotted around everywhere. So we are uh, making an effort to reduce those also by combining uh, the towers or uh, co-sharing them. Uh, the, you don't need three or four towers in the same location anymore. You can use the same uh, uh, tower for everyone's equipment, all uh, mobile operators. So that also reduces the footprint. And uh, we are constantly upgrading the equipment, uh, introducing new technologies to reduce uh, consumption and reduce waste. But uh, all said and done, uh, I think one thing that should be uh, that everyone should consider is that every step, every small step that we can do uh, makes a difference. Uh, we uh, may not be a great contributor in terms of uh, pollution, but we can be a contributor in terms of reducing it. And we can encourage others also in terms of digitalization, in terms of adopting uh, practices like ours, uh, reducing the use of paper, reducing waste, uh, introducing uh, solar is perhaps a, a very easy, clean energy that we can all adopt. So all these things I think together would make a significant contribution. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hamad Saab, uh, uh, I'd just like to ask you, uh, you spoke of financing uh, and you spoke of uh, developing um, basically uh, the paperwork or assisting people, uh, companies with the paperwork. Have you had any um, uh, interesting uh, proposals to develop or related to financing? Uh, yes, uh, we have, uh, I'll, uh, as in the beginning, I gave an introduction of this uh, international organization that we represent in Pakistan called PFAN, Private Finance Advisory Network. Private Finance Advisory ne Network is a Vienna-based organization uh, working in 122 countries around the world. We have so far raised around more than $2 billion for clean energy products. This project has recently, uh, in the last few months, it has been launched in Pakistan, and we are focusing on clean energy, EV, electric vehicle, circular economy, energy efficiency. These are the four priority areas. We have so far received uh, a huge number of applications, and out of the, all the applications, which are more than 50, 22 have qualified for our support. Now, how would we be supporting? We, for each of the project, that is the project can be from a corporate sector, it can be in, in the uh, private sector, it can be from an NGO, but it has to be a large scale project, medium scale project, ranging from 1 million to $50 million. That is our sweet spot. So we support projects of this, this range, $1 million to $50 million, and help them in raising their financings. Talking about the types of the project, we have received products related to EV. Very interesting products in the electric vehicle cycle because all of us know are very well aware of the fact that vehicular pollution, air pollution, and vehicular carbon emission is huge. So one of the way to mitigate that is to promote electric vehicle. So we have we have received very innovative products related to EV. And when we say EV, we are not catering for LEV only two wheeler, or three wheeler, or four wheeler. We are talking about the whole value chain of the EV sector. And the whole value chain of EV sector includes EV two wheelers, EV three wheelers, EV charging stations, EV uh, manufacturing of EVs, and even any fintech that revolves around this 
value chain of EV or that would facilitate or this EV transition into Pakistan, any FinTech application, any tech application related to EV will cater for that also. So we have, we have received applications in all of these value chains of EV and we are supporting them. Now the question is how, do, how are we supporting them? We, for each project, we assign financial expert who work on the project development. We assigned an investment expert who would work with the numbers we would improve the because globally would would our research has uh, uh, we have seen from the research that is done by the PFAN Global is that the clean energy products they are not get, getting financing and one of the reasons that they are not getting financing is the gap and what is the gap gap is bankable feasibilities Bank, uh, gap is financial institutions the in, individual investors the institutional investors they are not investing in the clean energy projects because they lack of financial modeling that they lack the numbers that their financial institutions are looking for. So here our project comes in. We work with the project for each project that has applied at the 23 projects, 22 projects that we are working with them. For each project, we'll be assigning financial expert and investment expert who work with the industry for, for with that project for a period of three to six months. They will come up with a good numbers, good proposal, and then there would be an, another consultant that would be attached to that project and that would connect that project with the potential investors. And now the, this whole process might take a period uh, time from three months to nine months or a year. And, we'll and the whole cost of this documentation, the consulting cost, that would be borne by our project. So this is how we work. And I would encourage the esteemed organizations that are part of this panel, that if they have some projects related to clean energy, EV, circular economy, energy efficiency, or any other projects which are, they think that uh, financially viable for which investment could be raised locally. We are also uh, having a license with the different financial institutions. There are many financial institutions that are already part of us, both local and international. We are looking for more financial institutions to be part of it. And uh, because we have, I uh, just uh, like I told you that we have a success story of raising around more than $2 billion globally. And the next big projects, they are all coming from Pakistan. So we're looking forward for projects and uh, to help these projects and uh, help the clean energy transition in Pakistan. Okay, thank you. Um, Maha, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna hand over to you uh, if you have any questions or. Sure, thank you so much, Nazish. Um, thank you everyone for your very insightful comments and uh, you know, I think the discussion was uh, very educational, even for me. Um, I'll quickly wrap up with, um, I guess, some of the key highlights that were discussed. Um, so we need to really focus on the business case for climate adaptation. I think that's a running theme that was highlighted by a number of companies, including um, Spyelectric and others. Um, and we need to actually focus again on the business case for sustainability rather than just um, doing it for uh, an altruistic motive. Um, and just as a comeback to that, actually, there is a business case for sustainability, which um, Temu had uh, pointed towards, you know, some of the, I guess, uh, positives coming out of this is competitive advantage for companies uh, through greater resource efficiency and optimization of their uh, both human and um, other resources. Um, and then just abilities to, you know, do work more efficiently and uh, provide kind of longer term um, perspectives to current business models. So we have like, you know, I guess, staying power. Um, secondly, uh, the theme that was highlighted was ways to um, finance uh, the transition um, to renewable energy and also to invest upfront, um, you know, in, in business models that can actually uh, pay you back in a longer period of times so over 20 years, for example. So there is a need to work with the government, with the private sector, with the banking sector and other financial um, institutions to find ways to actually uh, provide working capital and upfront finance for some of these initiatives. Um, the third theme that was kind of brought up was reducing regulation. Um, one of the examples which I thought was interesting is how you know, diesel generators are easy to purchase, but getting a renewable energy um, system installed uh, takes a lot more kind of running around and there's, it's a bureaucratic process. Um, and then finally, some of the opportunities which were highlighted by different organizations, the WWF representative mentioned uh, the Dutch Fund for Climate uh, Development and the NAMA Funds for the Textile Industry. Um, and then as Hamal Saab mentioned, the Private Finance Advisory Network. I think these are three kind of new um, 
financing opportunities that uh, companies in Pakistan could benefit from, either in terms of like smaller pilot projects or even for like some of their subsidiaries. Um, and uh, I guess finally, uh, I'd just like to thank everyone for, uh, for being part of this conversation. If anyone has any last comments, uh, please feel free to um, you know, jump in right now. I have something to add to the house. Yes. Uh, I want everyone from the house to read this book. It's called Do Pakistan by Kazim Saeed. It's a very interesting book. It's, uh, it's a compilation of uh, the economic situation of Pakistan over a few years and also the solutions you can have. Everybody which is thinking about development of Pakistan can have this book. It's very wonderful. Yeah. Book. Is and it from, is it from a, a political angle? No, sir. It's <laughs> not from any political angle, but it's from development angle. It's okay. a wonderful book. It gives a lot of solutions from around the world. Uh, you can have examples and how to develop Pakistan in a better way. All right. Um, Mahal, sorry, Nazish, I, can, I, can I just contribute uh, a little mm -hmm. of uh, the kind of work that PBC is doing on the broader advocacy front, uh, which has some relevance to you know the topics that we've been talking about. Um, I think the you know the the linkage between purpose and profit is not always clear. I think we have to be very realistic about that. Um, and, and particularly that link uh, varies between the short term and the long term. Usually it does come around in the long term, in the short run, uh, that's not very clear. Uh, and, and unfortunately, uh, the tenures of the key decision makers are relatively short term. So therefore, there is no great incentive that they have uh, for the long term. Um, so that, 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 that's something that's not new. It has been there for a while. Uh, I think the, the challenge here is to get the institutions to buy into it as opposed to just the individuals who are leading the institutions. Obviously, it won't happen if the leaders don't agree to it too. Um, so that, that's one thing I want to part. The other thing is that, uh, unfortunately, uh, the, uh, the pressures that we currently face under the IMF program have led to a significantly wrong direction in some of the, uh, the fiscal measures uh, that the, they were brought about as a result of the uh, recent budget. So import duty on solar panels, I think, goes uh, against the grain. Uh, higher duty on EVs, whether they are cars or, or not, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, I think that's also a movement in the right, wrong direction. The fact that Pakistan has the cheapest petrol uh, doesn't augur well for, for either curbing consumption or, or even uh, curbing the, the balance of trade deficit. So that's, I think, a, an ongoing uh, challenge uh, that we have. Um, the, the fact that uh, I think, uh, you know, was mentioned by Osman, that the solar industry is more regulated than, than, than you know, what, what uh, it would take to set up a generator, whether it is at your home or into your, at your, your office, um, is, is something that is eye-opening for me. And I, the more I think about it, it's absolutely true. Uh, I mean, I had to put up a, a, a net metering uh, installation on, on, on our roof uh, a few years ago and it took about four and a half months to, to get the license and so on. I know that the things have been made easier but 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 if I wanted to put up a generator whether it's a diesel or a gas it, you know I, I could do it without seeking any permission at all from anybody. Um, so so I, I think these are these are the kind of uh, challenges that we face in the broader advocacy uh, you know uh, uh, space uh, but you know, we, we need to keep, uh, you know, espousing cause uh, and fighting for the right, uh, you know, directions, etc. And that's what PBC is all about, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone from CERB and Globeside and BBC uh, for joining us. Uh, we look forward to con connecting with you again um, on these topics. and. Um, Please uh, reach out to us if you have any uh, questions or queries.